I think students tend to get pretty afraid when they hear the word organic chemistry. They're like, I'm not a chemistry major. I don't want to learn organic or that's where all the pre-meds go to take this course that just weeds them all out, right? I'm not taking the MCAT. But really, organic chemistry is the language of molecules. So we'd probably be better off just changing it to like molecules or molecular engineering or something or how molecules behave. And the first thing to know about organic chemistry is how to speak organic chemistry. It's a bit like a language. So first thing to know in any language is like how to count to 10. And so for one carbon atom, for uh, Anytime you have one carbon atom bonded to a number of substituents, so four substituents, a substituent is the thing that's attached to uh, the carbon atom. Usually substituent itself means the thing that's not hydrogen, but let's just go with me. Go with me. So methane is CH4. Uh, methyl is something bonded to the CH3, so you still have four bonds, so it's still meth. Um, bonded to one carbon atom. So anything with one carbon atom is meth something. So counting to 10, one methane, two ethane, three propane, four butane, five pentane, six hexane, seven heptane, eight octane, nine nonane, 10 decane, 11 undecane, 12 dodecane. How to draw organic structures. So we have, uh, Ironically, in organic chemistry, which is the chemistry of carbon and predominantly hydrogen atoms, the ironic thing is that we don't ever uh, or very rarely draw the carbon atoms and the hydrogen atoms directly. So what we have here is a zigzag structure consisting of five carbon atoms where each kink and chain end in the drawing is a carbon atom. And if it's not already bonded to four things, then you assume that every other bond is to an implicit hydrogen atom. So this structure here on the left equals this structure here on the right. What I forgot to say earlier about counting to 10 in organic is that anytime you cut a bond, say you, you have a something bonded to a CH3 group or a C2H, or I'm sorry, a CH2 CH3 group, that's ethyl, not ethane. So it's ethyl if the ethane is bonded to something else. So uh, verify that you could draw all, you know, 12 um, alkanes. Alkane means linear hydrocarbon or it could be a branched hydrocarbon, but it's just carbon and oxygen that is fully um, saturated, meaning that every carbon atom has four bonds to it. Next thing we need to know is something about functional groups. So functional groups uh, involve reactive structures that have atoms in them other than carbon or hydrogen. So ROH, where R is something that starts with carbon, but it could be anything. ROH is alcohol, RNH2 is amine, RSH is thiol. Then we have another class of functional groups that are called carbonyl compounds. They have a special kind of reactivity and they all have in, uh, in common the C double bond O, which is in the center of each structure. That is called a carbonyl group. The carbonyl compounds that are most often come up in nanoengineering and chemical engineering are R, C double bond O, OH, which is carboxylic acid, R1, C double bond O, and then that carbon atom is bonded to an OR2, where the R's, the R groups are labeled one and two because they could be different. That's called an ester. Then we have R1, C double bond O, bonded to an NR2, uh, uh, which is an amide or amide, tomato, tomato, or peptide. In, a, in biological systems, it's called a peptide bond. Everywhere else, it's called an amide bond. Finally, we have, we have functional groups that are based on carbon atoms bonded to other carbon atoms, and that could be an alkane, uh, which is a C single bond C. Now, there aren't that many uh, reaction conditions that can actually break these C double bond or C single bond C bonds, but there are a few and they're very, very, very industrially important. Then we have an alkene, which is a C double bond C. Then we have an alkyne, which is a C triple bond C. 
Chemical reactivity, there is a lot you could learn about it, but the basics are as follows. Anytime you have lone pairs and polarized bonds, so lone pairs and a bond that has a difference in electronegativity between atoms, you can have the potential for reactivity. And this is a, an example of, an, of the synthesis of an ether that is two carbon atoms bonded through an oxygen atom. And this is how you do it. You start with an oxygen or start with an, with an alcohol or hydroxyl or the, uh, on the left-hand side where the, the, uh, the lone pairs on the oxygen attack this dipole. And the dipole is made of a C bonded to a Br, carbon bonded to bromide. And bromide carries a slight negative charge compared to, to uh, carbon because of the difference in electronegativity. And that lone pair, um, due to the sort of the attractiveness of this anti-bonding orbital on the back of the carbon atom, gets attacked by this this double bond on the oxygen atom. It kicks off the bromide atom, which takes on the negative charge, and um, and then uh, bonds associates with this uh, hydrogen. Uh, uh, ion that comes off, which is basically a proton. So you end up with HBr as a condensation, or I'm sorry, uh, in this case, you wouldn't necessarily call it a condensation, but a byproduct, basically HBr, when the product that you're most interested in is this ether. All right, there are some reactions of double bonds that are very useful in the synthesis of polymers. So in the top row, we have uh, ethene or ethylene bonded to itself many many times where one of those double bonded carbon atom or one of those double bonds moves over to form a bond with the next ethene atom to get this zigzag structure that's called polyethylene that's like um, that's like plastic bags basically the second row you have a more complicated double bond structure in the monomer but you get the same kind of structure that's called methyl methacrylate when you polymerize that together, you get something called polymethyl methacrylate. In this case, too, you have this zigzag of bonds in the back with this group hanging off. And that PMMA, polymethyl methacrylate, is uh, plexiglass or acrylic uh, polymers, which are very useful in nanoengineering as photoresists and electron beam resists, which we will cover uh, uh, in a later uh, video. And finally, the generic structure, which is shows any vinyl monomer where you have an X group hanging off of a double bond. And when you want to know the product of that reaction, you just draw a zigzag structure and then put an X group on every other carbon atom. And these um, polymers are all made by a mechanism called chain growth, which we'll get to in a second. Then um, we also have other types of reactions called uh, that are based on the chemistry and reactivity of carbonyl compounds, and they follow a reaction pathway called polycondensation. And the way to recognize a polycondensation product is that the polymer product has atoms in it other than carbon. <laughs> and if you have N groups or O groups uh, in it, chances are it was made by a polycondensation uh, reaction, especially if there are also carbonyl groups, so C double bond O groups coming off the backbone. These aren't hard and fast rules, but this will get you 98% of the, the way there. So this is an example of the synthesis of nylon. So nylon ropes, um, nylon clothing, zip ties, fishing line, and so on. So you take a diamine, you add it to a diacid chloride, and in the presence of base, you get a polyamide product. In this case, it's nylon plus a condensation product, which is 2-HCl. Okay. Now, the nice thing about that nylon product is because we have hydrogen bond donors and hydrogen bond acceptors in the structure, we get nice, uh, we get nice good tensile properties, uh, crystallization, we have a lot of good things going on there in terms of tensile strength. Okay, there are two types of general mechanisms by, way, uh, by which polymer structures are formed. The first is chain growth, where you have one monomer and then you add another monomer and another monomer and another monomer like links in a chain, and that's called chain growth. Chain growth 
is further subdivided into two different uh, modalities. One is uncontrolled chain growth. So this is something that free radical polymerization, you might have heard of that, uh, follows, which is where you get uh, a chain forming here in the reaction mixture, then somewhere else you have a chain forming, and a chain forming goes pop. Pop, pop, pop. I call that the popcorn mechanism for the formation of polymers. And you get a, sort of an uncontrolled um, uh, arrangement of polymer structures and polymer molecular weights. Alternatively, the second way that chain growth works is that all the polymer chains grow at the same time at the same rate. We do that by deliberately slowing down the rate at which the polymer chains are formed. And usually we have some kind of capping group that just lets in one or two polymer or monomer structures at a time to form the chain. I call that as opposed to the polymer or to the popcorn mechanism, the grass grass growth mechanism. So we have popcorn mechanism and the grass, uh, the grass growing mechanism. And that gives you a nice smooth uh, uh, molecular weight. In contrast to those two methods of chain growth, we have another class called step growth. And that is any monomer or polymer chain in the mixture can react with any other polymer or, or chain end in the reaction mixture at the same time. So it goes 2, 4, 6, uh, 12, 24, 32. You just add these monomers uh, together at any time. And uh, as such, at the very beginning of uh, and that's how polycondensation like polyamid is formed. And as a result, if you plot the molecular weight versus the percent reacted functional groups, you start out with a very low molecular weight in any time in the reaction mixture early on, and then you get much bigger molecular weights toward the end of the reaction. And that's very typical of step growth polymerization. It's like having a penny, then doubling it every day for a month. And at the end of 30 days, you'll have a million dollars. So that's how it works. Finally, I want to mention a word about molecular weight. There are two ways of measuring molecular weight uh, that are used commonly a lot in the lab. One is the conventional number average, M sub N, where it's simply the arithmetic mean of the number of polymer chains with degree of polymerization, that is number of monomers, uh, indicated by I times the, the mass of each molecule with the degree of polymerization or number of monomers I. And you divide that by the total number of molecules in the mixture, which is N uh, subscript I. And that, so if you have a, an example of a polymer that has, uh, that has 10 polymer chains and nine of them have two monomers and one of them has a million monomers just to be kind of absurd then you have a total molecular weight of 1,018,000 and so that's one the conventional average is 1,018,000 divided by 10. So now you have the molecular weight that's just uh, the average molecular weight that's just just a little bit over a hundred thousand. Now the properties of that sample are going to for sure be dominated by that one chain that has a huge molecular weight, right? So instead of the weight or the number average molecular weight, it is oftentimes better to use the weight average molecular weight, which is given by this equation here, where you take W sub I, which is the weight of the entire sample with degree of polymerization I, and you multiply that by the mass of the individual chain with that degree of polymerization, and you divide that by the weight of the entire sample. So in that case, you can do the arithmetic uh, out for the, uh, for the case that I described, and you'll end up with a molecular weight M sub W that is much, much closer to 1 million, which is actually a more accurate way of determining the, uh, of predicting the properties of that sample, which of course are going to be dominated by that one polymer chain with a molecular weight of a million. See you next time.